I thank Ed and Ear and Arthur and the organizers of this school for this opportunity to give this talk. And I will use this opportunity to talk about my research. Starting a long time ago until more or less today. <laughs> Chemometrics, infrared intensities, and electronic structures of molecules. An alternative title might be Why I Learned Some Chemometrics. In the early days of chemometrics, the 1970s, I became involved in a problem that today you call quantitative structure activity relationships, QSOM. It was in the master's thesis of Alfredo Simis. His advisor was Richard Brown. They tried to predict biological activity of drugs using quantum chemistry to calculate semi-empirical electronic indices. They used multiple linear regression to relate, to correlate the indices from the computer program to the biological activity. They changed a substituent on the chloramphenicol molecule. They left the characteristic nitro group on the benzene ring fixed in their study. They studied 12 different chloramphenicols and they calculated, well, hundreds of electronic indices. We have programs nowadays not only in quantum chemistry, but in even statistics, you know. You put a few numbers in, and a thousand or more numbers come out. And this is what happened in those days. Well, they decided to more or less arbitrarily, or we decided, to concentrate on these seven electronic indices and use subsets to calculate biological activities. So, we had a big problem how to reduce the number of variables. I have too little, too, only 12 objects, and I have hundreds of variables. We know we can't do that. Our statistics professor said, a lot of objects and not too many variables. So, I just want to let you know, in those days, we did not have a microcomputer. <laughs> And so we did the quantum calculations, the CMDO calculations, on a PDP-10 digital computer corporation that had 64 gigabytes of random access memory. <laughs> and on these little disk machines, we could store a megabyte. <laughs> uh, and the worst thing, the computer was used by the whole university, Winnie County. But in those days, Winnie County was smaller than it is today, I must be. Uh, so I needed to solve the problem, reduce the variables. And I heard about chemometrics. And I got in touch with Bruce Plowski in Seattle, in the United States, and after some time, he sent us a computer program. And this is the computer program. It is Arthur 81, ASCII 800 BPI, nine tracks, well, I won't go into the detail. But, uh, we started doing chemometric calculations using that program on the computer that I showed you. Here is a picture of Bruce Kowalski and myself with my two daughters at that time. 
We were in Sarah Negra collecting water to study on a Brazilian mineral water project, as I call it. We wanted to do a study on cachaça, <laughs> but we did not have enough money to do it. <laughs> so we studied water. This became Vieta's master's thesis, which she defended in 1981. So that got us a start in chemical methods. To read this page, you needed the state reader. And in fact, there weren't too many mini styles, mini skirts in those days, you know. So here is an example of the tape reader. Now I will get into the more serious subject, at least I think it's more serious. It's vibrational spectroscopy. Here is a spectrum of propanol. And the spectroscopist is interested in the band position, the band shape, and the intensity. Or, better speaking, maybe the molar absorptivity, the extinction coefficient. Why are some infrared band taking you away? Concentration and wavelength, why are some infrared bands strong and others weak? Most chemists know selection rules, but we wanted to go a little bit more deeper than just symmetry related uh, matters. And as you know, in the infrared spectrum, we have many fundamental bands. Here's another one, just as an example. Here's another one. And so you have the intensities of all these bands. And the molecular structure electronic structure determines if a band is weak or if it is strong. There are three n minus six vibrations in a molecule where n is the number of atoms. And the infrared intensity is proportional to the square of the dipole moment derivative of the vector, the dipole moment vector with respect to normal coordinates. And here are the ith normal coordinate, since there are three n minus six of these relations. We can measure the intensities, but when we try to determine the derivative, we do not know whether that derivative is plus or minus. Or minus. Okay? Because when you take the square root, you know, the sign is indeterminate. Well, that's important because if you want to know the dipole moment function, you need to know the sign of the derivative, if it's plus or if it's minus. And our problem is we have many different possible sign combinations. Two to the three n minus six. If you work in normal coordinates, it is not very convenient because the normal coordinate has different for uh, uh, different displacements for molecules that are related by isotopic substitution. An isotopically substituted molecule should have the same uh, results for the electronic structure as the, the water molecule. The heavy water and the water should have the same electronic structure changes, but since the vibration is different, the values are normal coordinate, you do symmetry coordinate, or internal coordinate, or Cartesian coordinate. Here I have an example of symmetry coordinates. These vibrations are the same. And the derivative for this vibration, or this symmetry coordinate, is the same as the derivative for this. That you compare the two and determine the sign of the dipole moment. Here's an example dipole moment derivative sign selection using isotopic invariance criterion. The fact that electronic structure does not change when you substitute deuterium for hydrogen, 
Lord Oppenheimer approximation within that. Well, and uh, here are also quantum chemical bodies. And here I list some of the possible sign combinations for these derivatives with respect to symmetry particles. I'm looking for one with hydrogen, the other with deuterium, that have the same values within the experimental area. But at the same time, they have to agree with the theoretical values. I, there are 120 possible pairs to examine. You pick out one pair that agrees with the theoretical. So we solve this using principal components, these dipole derivatives for dichloroethylene, the cis, and here are the points in red represent the hydrogen isotope of dichloroethylene, the points in black, the deuterium isotopically substituted molecule for dichloroethylene, and blue, the theoretical one. And what we're looking for is a proximity of three values, like this here. The theoretical value is in good agreement with one hydrogen and one deuterium value. And so, but we also realized that, you know, this could also, this pair is pretty close to the theoretical values. So we saw, we decided to accept all these sets as being within experimental error. <coughs> and so we can calculate an experimental uh, average value where we determine the signs. Here are the signs of the dipole moment with respect to normal coordinates. So we were able to determine three of the four. One of the intensities is so weak, it was not, we were not able to determine it, but it does not affect the values very much. Well, let me get to the next topic. When I started studying chemometrics, I got some information from the International Chemometrics Society. And it said, chemometrics is the science. Well, I take this, uh, this text from the site of the 13th Scandinavian Symposium on Chemistry, which I, chemometrics, which I happen to see. But it's the same as what I read 35 years ago. Telemetrics is the science of extracting information from complex data systems. The key to success in chemometric multivariate modeling is hence high quality data management. Identifying features and patterns in the data that leads to information, which becomes knowledge when the patterns and their implications are realized and understood. In other words, the information from infrared intensities, and we get soft models, knowledge, molecular electronic structure, hard models. That is the goal. Information, uh, here, information from infrared fundamental intensities, soft models, knowledge about electronic structures and their changes on vibrations, hard models. To do this, we used the molecular polar tensor. We've never heard of that. But the molecular polar tensor is a big matrix, 3 pi n matrix. And each time it, is, it has n matrices, each of which are 3 by 3 matrices. The lines. The first row represents the x direction of the dipole moment vector, the y component, and the z component in the second and third lines. Each column represents a displacement of one of the atoms in the model. And so if I know this atomic polar tensor for each one of the n atoms, I know what happens to the electronic structure when anything vibrates or is displaced in the model. All the information. So we use that to study the floral, floral carbons. These are the molecules, about 12 of them. There were a total of 60 atoms. Each one has nine polar tensor elements. And so our data matrix, by today's standard, very small, 
60 by 9. Polar tensor elements are not very good to study in the, but for comparing molecules because they depend on the orientation of the molecule in the Cartesian space. So what we did is look for invariants. We know that the trace of a matrix is invariant to similarity transformations and rotations are similarity transformations. So that doesn't change. Also, the determinant, what was called the effective charge, which is simply one third the trace of the atomic polar tensor times its transpose and the sum of the cofactors. And if you've ever studied Raman spectroscopy, you're familiar with the anisotropy of, of the, the tensor. And so we use these five invariants to try to do, have similar information, understand what happens to electronic structure when the molecule collapses. Here's our matrix, the 60 by 5 data matrix for chemometric analysis. Here are our fluoral, fluoral methanes, and here are our five invariants. Uh, we did a principal complement analysis, and it was very, gave the following results. Here's the first principal component against the second. It has almost all the information. The first principal component is actually a, pretty much a weight, uh, an average of four of the five invariants. The other invariant is approximately the principal component, the second principal component. And we know it, there's a pattern here. The first principal component depends on electronegativity. Look at the carbons. All the black symbols are for carbon and the methane molecules. And the least polar molecules are here. And the most polar molecules are on the left. So electronegativity of the terminal atoms increases in this direction. Also, for the terminal atoms, there seems to be a trend too but in the opposite direction. So we decided, let's get rid of the principal compound and graph something we understand better. Let's take this first invariant and graph against the second invariant and this anisotropy. This first invariant here, P bar sub alpha, is called the mean dipole primitive, but uh, we could use, do a graph of any one of these four. The other thing we noticed is, is the anisotropy uh, is determined by, the uh, that uh, top one is determined by symmetry. Here we have the floral athletes, the, 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 the floral methanes, and here we have the, the floral methanes. And as you can see, the more symmetric molecules are on top, and the more polar molecules are on the bottom. When we graph the mean dipole moment primitive against the anisotropy, then it even looks better. Assigning negative values to the electronegativities of the halogen molecules, as we can see, we go from fluorine, chlorine, bromine, the hydrogen, which is about zero, it has only zero, but uh, uh, mean dipole primitive, and the carbon dipole primitives increase as we go to the right with the most polar molecules and the ones uh, with the most electronegative terminal atoms on the right. So, uh, there we found a trend which helped us change a lot of our thinking about polar tensors. And then we decided to do a graph of the mean dipole moment derivative against electronegativity using uh, the molecular Jaffe scale. And here you get a good straight line for all the atoms, fluorine until we go through methane here, the hydrogens, and also CF4. This is a soft model uh, because we, don't under, we can't explain anything 